Here are some facts. About seven out of every 10 deaths from COVID-19 are people over the age of 80. Fully 97% of COVID-19 deaths in Canada have occurred in those over the age of 60. That prompted somebody to write me an email a week or so ago asking whether we do a program on whether the entire world's approach to this pandemic is wrong, whether it was a mistake to quarantine 90% of people who are apparently at minimal risk of death rather than focus on the 10% who are genuinely in peril? Well, the answer is yes, we would do that show. And here it comes. We welcome from the downtown of the provincial capital, Dr. Eileen Davila, Medical Officer of Health for the City of Toronto, and Dr. Richard Shabus, who's a former Medical Officer of Health for the province of Ontario. It's really good of both of you uh, to join me today for this conversation, which feels uh, particularly timely since we are starting to reopen the economy here in the city and in the province. So why don't we start with this? Are we in the midst of a genuine global pandemic that requires the self-isolation of essentially the entire population? Dr. Davila, why don't you start? Well, I think, Steve, I would start off with the fact that, yes, indeed, we are in the midst of a global pandemic, and the numbers bear that out. What the response looks like and what's required will depend on which point in the outbreak a given jurisdiction, city, or country is in. Uh, and I think you have seen uh, changing approaches and different approaches and different actions depending on what exactly is happening in the local circumstance. Dr. Shabas, same question. Yeah, and fundamentally the answer to, to your question from my standpoint is, is yes. I mean, it is, it is a global pandemic. It's a, it's a terrible natural disaster and hundreds of thousands of people have died and many, many more people will die but our response which was i think fueled has been fueled primarily by the kind of panic that set in in the world in the middle of march uh is an overreaction uh and it's it's basically a self-destructive reaction because not only is the degree of our reaction i think unnecessary but it's also fundamentally doing more harm uh to ourselves to our our um our, our society to what in, pu in public health we call the social determinants of health, education, uh, employment, social connectiveness, uh, that will ultimately do more harm than good. Dr. Davila, come back on that if you would. Well, you know, I can't agree more with Richard on the fact that the social determinants of health are really what underpins health status. And those of us who work in the realm of public health, and I can tell you many of us had the opportunity and the great privilege of learning from colleagues like Dr. Richard Chavis over the many years. So we'll tell you absolutely what actually, you know, what is the job of public health and what are we meant to do? We're meant to improve health status to reduce inequities in health status, and to prepare for and respond to outbreaks and emergencies. And I would tell you that COVID-19, as Dr. Shabas rightfully points out, is a global pandemic, has caused a great deal of illness, uh, you know, with many, many deaths around the world and many yet to come. Uh, so what was needed was a response that actually took into account how do we manage all the implications of COVID-19? And I think that what we did, uh, certainly here in Toronto, was focus on key objectives, which include minimizing or preventing the loss of life as much as possible, ensuring that we preserve the capacity of our healthcare system to respond and to address needs, including the needs of those who had COVID-19 and those who have other medical needs. And of course, the third and, and also an important component and objective of the response was ensuring that we were minimizing to the greatest extent possible the social, the economic and the broader health impacts of COVID-19. That's what our response was working towards. That's what we continue to do. And I, I think that's where we need to continue to keep our eye on. I got to do a quick follow up with you, though, because he says you have dramatically over responded, overreacted, and in doing so had an adverse impact on all of those social determinants of health you just listed. What's your view on that? Well, my view on this is quite simple. When you look at the data and you look at the experiences, right? In fact, when we look at, at, at uh, countries or jurisdictions, cities and the like, which either, you know, some did no lockdown, 
Some did early lockdown, some did late lockdown. And when you line them up and take a look at what actually happened in terms of those different jurisdictions, right? Whether people were moving around, what mobility, what degree of mobility did we see? What kind of change in, in retail behaviors and other human behaviors did we see? You actually can't see a difference from one place to the next. So in fact, it wasn't so much about the response. I, I think that might be uh, characterized as a bit of a, uh, an application of what I would call retro epidemiology. Uh, you know, we can look backwards and try to judge the actions at the time, but in fact, what we saw was that people were reacting premised on the data that they saw. There's so much data available uh, in a way that it has never been made available before. People were actually afraid and understandably so when we have a novel virus that was actually causing a great deal of illness and a great deal of death, people were actually making choices on their own. It wasn't out of uh, a response to public health actions. In fact, people were responding um, based on what they saw, what they saw in other jurisdictions, what the numbers looked like, and frankly, their concerns and understandable fears of getting sick and dying. Dr. Shabus, you wrote a piece in the Globe and Mail a few months back, which asked the question, is COVID-19 a global crisis? And you answered it by saying, certainly, for people who can't add. What do you mean by that? Well, what I meant at the time was that the, uh, the number of cases, the number of deaths from COVID-19 was, was quite small. And I think my general impression, and I was by no means alone in this, is that COVID-19 was going to follow in the footsteps of the first SARS and of MERS. And in fact, I would suggest that at the, the end of February, as the outbreak in Wuhan was fading very quickly, uh, that there was some reason to think that was going to be the case. That was wrong. I was wrong. And, and it, has, it has been a very different animal uh, than the first SARS or the MERS. They were both coronaviruses. This is different. This has spread much more widely. Uh, it's, it's caused much more, uh, it, it, I think, unlike the other two, it is a, it is a, a genuine pandemic. But coming back to what Eileen said, I, I don't want to look backwards. I don't want to criti be critical of what she or other public health people decided to do in March or in April. Those were those were difficult times. There was a great deal of uncertainty. There was, uh, I don't mean this pejoratively, there was an element of panic. We were we were faced with these these models which were coming up with very extravagant projections about what was going to happen. And I think people reacted in what they thought was the appropriate manner at the time. But it's three months later now. It's three months later, and I think we have a much more realistic view of what this virus can and can't do. We have a much better understanding of it. I think the, the numbers that you quoted right at the beginning about the age distribution, the quite remarkable age skewing of the serious impact of, of, of COVID-19, which is, is even, even more dramatic than we get from influenza, uh, really points the way to a more rational way of dealing with this. I, I'm not suggesting that we don't have a serious problem. And I think we have to understand that whatever route we take with COVID-19, there is going to still be a great deal of pain. This thing is not going away anytime soon. And much as we would love to have a vaccine, uh, we have to be realistic that that's, again, not going to happen anytime soon. And it may not happen for, for a very long time. And even when it does, it may not be quite the panacea we hope for. So whatever route we choose is going to have, is going to be difficult. But what I'm saying fundamentally is we have to find ways of mitigating the impact of this disease in ways that are sustainable and that don't destroy the fabric of what really matters for public health, which are these, uh, these, uh, these social determinants. And so I know when I spoke to the House of Commons Health Committee a few weeks ago, I suggested that we lay down what we would consider our non-negotiables. I would regard education uh, i.e. kids have to go to school is a non-negotiable. I would regard employment. People have to be able to go to work and earn their living as a non-negotiable. I, I would regard elective medical care and dental care as, as things that we, we cannot go without. And whereas for the last three months, our whole world has basically been, been molded to fit COVID control, I think going forward, 
uh, COVID control has got to be molded to fit the realities of our world. We have to find ways of mitigating, not eliminating, but mitigating the impact of COVID by protecting the vulnerable, but also in ways that allow us to continue with some semblance of a normal life and to protect what's really important to public health. Okay, fair enough, but I'm still trying to understand how transmissible this disease truly is. Because, and I'll put this to you, Dr. Davila. here's another quote out of uh, Richard Chavis's work. When COVID-19 finds a sweet spot, a cruise ship, a South Korean church, an Italian hospital, it can spread efficiently. And the bug has a nasty bite. But these are the exceptions and not the rule. The vast majority of infected people spread the disease to precisely no one. Is that accurate in your understanding of things, Dr. Davila? Well, you know, I, I, I think there's still much that we're trying to learn about this virus. I, I will agree with Dr. Shabas. We have learned certainly a great deal over the uh, course of the last uh, several months. But there is still much more that we have yet to understand. Uh, and the notion of transmission, you know, to what extent uh, are we seeing uh, transmission of virus from individuals who are basically asymptomatic or so mildly symptomatic that they, they're not even aware that they've got an infection? We still don't understand this. So it does present some challenges, but I do agree with Dr. Shabas that we have to find ways for us to coexist safely with COVID-19 in the world. That's the challenge that's before us. How do we manage this, uh, you know, very interesting virus uh, about which we understand more, but still don't have a complete understanding of yet? How do we find ways to coexist and to, to manage all those different aspects that Dr. Shabe has talked about? Because indeed, he's quite right that the, those, um, those factors that have longer term health impact are really about those social determinants of health, education, income, employment, you know, those kinds of opportunities and the ability to connect socially. These are the things that actually really drive health status and the kinds of things that we need to pay attention to in concert with learning about the virus and ensuring that we're doing the best we can to protect those who are most likely to have severe outcomes associated with COVID-19 infection. But I'm really trying to, uh, I, 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 I'm a little frustrated here because I don't quite understand. I, you two, I thought were in rather stark disagreement with each other. And I've heard both of you now agree with each other more times than I uh, imagined I'd hear uh, over the course of a year, never, more, never mind in the last 10 minutes. I hear Richard Chavis saying, and I read that he's saying, you know, the vast majority of people infected with this thing uh, are going to spread it to precisely nobody. And Dr. Davila, I watch you on TV all the time saying, you got to stay six feet apart. You got to keep the mask on. You got to watch what you do or else you're going to spread it to everybody. And I'm just a layman. Who do I believe here? Dr. Shabas, who do I believe? Well, you believe me, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Eileen's right. The science is evolving. Those statements I made three months ago, more than three months ago now, I guess, were based on initial impressions about what I saw from the the disease in China and what we knew about, about other coronaviruses. I think the bulk of the evidence over the last three months has tended to support that. And and that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, There's a very good evolutionary reason why respiratory viruses make us symptomatic, why they make us cough and sneeze. And they do that, or they survive better when they do that, because that's how they spread. And that's true for, for influenza, that's true for colds, that's true for all respiratory viruses. So it really shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that the major engine of spread of of COVID is through symptomatic people. Now, there's still a lot of uncertainty and debate about how important asymptomatic spread is. I think the evidence is is evolving in a direction that is much more in line with with what I said three months ago, which is that asymptomatic spread is really not not very important. There was a little a little tempest in a teapot over the last few days with the World Health Organization, where Dr. Kirkova, who's the the uh, the technical lead for for COVID-19, made a statement a couple of days ago in a press conference that asymptomatic spread was very rare, and of course that triggered this whole reaction of people saying. 
just as you did. Oh my God, that means we don't need to social distance. We certainly don't need masks, all of the above. And of course, the WHO, I'm sure, came down on her like a ton of bricks because it completely undermined what the WHO leadership would be. So a day later, she comes back and she says, what I said wasn't exactly WHO policy. It's just what the studies show. So there you have it. I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's I don't think it's in the bag, but the reality is, I mean, the reality is that the disease is not spread in the way people think it's spread. Um, you know, walking down the street, passing an asymptomatic person, you're not going to spread the disease. You know, the disease is spread indoors. It's spread primarily, if maybe not quite exclusively, by symptomatic people. And generally, it's going to take prolonged close contact, not just not a second passing in the street. So I think if we can, if we can get our minds around, I think what we do know that it's much harder to transmit than the than many people have been given the impression it is and that many of our measures like walking down the street wearing a mask make no sense at all in terms of disease prevention i think that's at least a step in the right direction that we don't have to be quite as afraid of one another as we've been up till now okay let me talk about our response because and i'll go back to the person who sent me the original email a week and a half ago saying uh steve Rather than shut down all of society and essentially, you know, put half of us out of out of work, what if we had simply allowed the economy to continue, paid the very small percentage of people who are vulnerable to this thing, genuinely vulnerable, at risk of death, uh, paid them to stay home, and really put that iron ring, Premier Ford talks about, put that iron ring around people who are the most vulnerable, but essentially let the rest of society keep going, and and make the most vulnerable stay home until a, a vaccine is developed. That was a different approach, obviously, than the one we took. Dr. Davila, any, could, can you tell me whether that other approach that we didn't take, what would have happened had we done that? You know, I don't know, Steve, that any of us can actually say what would have happened had we done this or, or that. I think that uh, we can certainly try to study and understand uh, what might make sense for the future. And uh, I do think that making sure that we take care of those who we now know are most vulnerable to negative outcomes uh, associated with COVID-19 infection is a wise course of action on the go-forward basis. Uh, but I do think that the actions that we took at the time were exactly reasonable given what we knew, what we understood of the circumstances, and frankly, uh, what people were feeling at that time. Um, I, I think people were understandably afraid. They saw stories, we saw stories of what was happening in New York and what happened to their healthcare system. We saw stories, we saw stories of people in Italy who are, you know, in their 50s and 60s being turned away from hospitals uh, because their healthcare capacity had been so completely overwhelmed. Thankfully, because of the actions that we took here and frankly because of the behaviors that people adopted here. Uh, we're, we're grateful that we did not end up in that circumstance. I think for us now the challenge is how do we move forward? How do we address the social determinants of health? How do we make sure that we are setting ourselves up for successful and safe coexistence with COVID-19 until such time as we're able to get a combination of effective treatments and effective vaccines. Uh, and that, we don't know exactly when that's coming. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, we do have to find a way to live and coexist with COVID-19 uh, in a way that allows us to um, have some semblance of, of those aspects of life which we know are necessary and to which we've become accustomed. Well, Dr. Chabas, I'll give you this. You're nothing if not colorful in the way you write your columns, because there's another quote of yours I want to pluck out here, which says, quarantine belongs back in the Middle Ages. Save your masks for robbing banks. Stay calm and carry on. Let's not make our attempted cures worse than the disease. Do you think our attempted cure has been worse than this disease? I think we're headed that way. Uh, I think that uh, my, my, my real concern is, is not, again, what's happened has happened. Uh, we've done we've 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 done we've done some real damage to ourselves, but I, I don't think the damage is fatal. My concern is what lies ahead. I think that Ontario and its own 
lethargic way is ultimately going to follow the rest of the world and come out of lockdown over the summer, probably because the weather is going to play a big role in driving down this virus, although that's not absolutely a slam dunk, but we probably will succeed in coming out of lockdown. And Ontario, for reasons that frankly baffle me, and perhaps Eileen can shed some light on this, seems to have convinced itself that we can control this disease by something called contact tracing, something that public health has used with, with marginal effectiveness against diseases like chlamydia uh, for many years. But somehow that's going to allow us to keep this disease in check. I'm extraordinarily skeptical, but fine, they're going to take a shot at it, and that's fine. I hope I'm wrong, and I, I hope they can do it. But the, my real concern is that come next fall, come September uh, or beginning of October, the weather's going to get cold, and the virus is going to come back because, in fact, we have very little population immunity in, in Ontario, and the virus is going to come back. And my big concern is that our, our, our contact tracing measures will collapse very quickly, and there will be another panic and then we will lock down again, this time for a much longer period of time without any clear idea as to exactly why we're doing it. And then I think we will do ourselves very serious harm. So looking forward, I want us to learn the lessons of this. And what I keep saying is, if your plan A is you want to contact trace, fine, be my guest, good luck to you. But I want to know what the plan B is, because there has to be a plan B if and when that fails, that doesn't include this kind of highly destructive lockdown. Well, before we get to plan A or plan B, I do want to find out from Dr. Davila whether she thinks, apropos of the allegation made in um, Dr. Shabas's column, whether she thinks the cure has been worse than the, than the disease. And by that, I mean, I'm thinking about the people who died waiting for surgical procedures they didn't otherwise get. I'm thinking about the suicides, which are, I don't know about in the city of Toronto, but certainly in other places in North America are up. I'm thinking about the increased pressure we put on people who are suffering from mental health issues. And, um, and, and, and as Premier Ford said, you know, just the people who are squirrely through this whole thing, you know, three months under lockdown and they've had enough. What do you think about the price in terms of what we've paid to cure this thing? Well, I, I think as with everything, we're constantly trying to achieve the appropriate balance. I'm gonna bring us back again to what were the objectives of the response? What were we seeking to achieve uh, through the actions that we took uh, in the COVID-19 response? And they were to you know, prevent the loss of life as, you know, as much as possible, to uh, preserve healthcare capacity so that we had a healthcare system that would be available to meet medical needs, whether they were COVID-19 related or otherwise. And of course, to manage all and to, to minimize the negative social, economic, and broader health impacts associated with COVID-19. So we have been striving to achieve that balance. Uh, you know, is it perfection? Uh, you know, I think we can only hope for that. Uh, we try our very best, uh, and, and certainly in this corner of the world, we certainly tried our best to achieve that balance. Um, but we do have to find a way to move forward. Uh, we have been reasonably successful, I think, in respect of our first two objectives. Uh, we did not see the kinds of tragedies here in, in Toronto uh, that, that were witnessed in, in places like New York, um, nor in Northern Italy. But we do have to be very mindful now as to how we strike this balance. How do we make sure that we are managing all the social, economic, and broader health impacts, uh, you know, of the disease and of the situation in which we find ourselves. We have to help our population move forward uh, in a successful and safe way until we get those effective treatments and until we get effective vaccines. Uh, because Dr. Shabas is right. We do not have significant immunity. We don't have any reason to believe that um, people are, are largely immune to COVID-19. We remain susceptible. So we, we, um, we really do need to think about how we achieve this balance. How do we coexist safely with COVID-19 in our community and in our midst? In which case, Dr. Shabas, I'd like to know what you need to see. Let's say you had the job today. What would you need to see before I know a lot of Ontario is reopening already under stage two, but, but the capital city is not, and a lot of the regions around it. What do you need to see before Toronto and area can reopen? Well, 
I'll answer that question, but you wanted me to disagree with Eileen about something, and she just <laughs> gave me some some fuel for that. So let's let's do that. Um, okay. I think there are a lot of myths out there about what's happened in the world and what the the impact of the lockdown was. Eileen several times has talked about the healthcare system in New York City being overwhelmed. That's actually not true. Uh, let's let's not talk anecdote. The media has been filled with anecdotes. There were some hospitals in Queens that had their ICUs overcrowded. That's absolutely true. But let's talk numbers. Okay, New York City, before the, before the COVID outbreak hit New York City, they had 1,600 ICU beds. They were like everywhere else, very quickly able to ramp up that number by adding 1,900 additional ICU beds to 3,500 ICU beds. At the very peak of New York City's outbreak, their ICU census, the number of patients in intensive care uh, because of COVID was 850. They never even used up half of their surplus of their additional capacity. Yeah, there were some hospitals that got into trouble. That's because New York City doesn't function as a healthcare system. It functions as individual hospitals. That yeah. would never happen here. In Ontario, but you grant, you grant though that, that, that New York City was the hotbed for COVID-19 and they had disproportionately far more deaths than oh, most yeah. other places in the world. Oh, well, let's, let's okay, right. let's look at the numbers. Okay, okay, New York City, New York City has had a death rate of a little over 0.2%. That's a little bit over uh, 2,000 deaths per million population. If you look at the city of Montreal, that's in Canada, all right? And where they locked down in a timely fashion, they locked down before the outbreak, they did everything right in Montreal, uh, and their population death rate is now just 10% lower than New York City. They have one of the highest death rates in the world. Now, why did Montreal have such a terrible problem? I don't know, primarily related to long-term care, but to hold out lockdown as some sort of panacea that worked this miracle in Canada is not true. Look at the numbers. The, 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 the population death rate in Canada, and we're a very big country, so we have areas like Quebec with very high rates, but we also have areas like Atlantic Canada and British Columbia with very low rates. You compare what's happened here with what's happened in all of Europe where, yeah, they have places with very high death rates like Western Europe, but they also have large areas in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe with very low death rates. The population death rate in Canada is now 210 per million population, and in all of Europe, it's 240 per million population. Our experience actually is not very different than the European experience with COVID, notwithstanding the fact that we lock down early and often. Okay, Dr. Davila, we're down to our last minute. I'll give it to you to finish us up. Yeah, so, you know, I don't think anybody uh, would argue that lockdown, as, as Dr. Chavis calls it, was a panacea of any sort. I, I think, on the contrary, it was meant to be, and it was, a reasonable action to take given the circumstances and given the knowledge that we had at the time. Uh, you know, we can look backwards and, and, as I said, you know, apply retro epidemiology to, you know, comment on that which was done and whether it was good or appropriate or you know, whether we might have done something different. But I think quite frankly that it behooves us to look forward and think about what we've learned from our current experience, um, the experiences over the last several weeks, what we understand of our population now, where their minds are at, what they're prepared to do, and how best we help guide our population towards you know, optimal health including reducing health inequities in the experience of, of both COVID-19 outcomes and broader health outcomes and impacts. I think that's really where we should be investing our time, our effort, and our resources. I do want to thank both of you for coming on to TVO tonight and having such a civilized debate, which featured um, a bit of disagreement, not all that much, but a bit of disagreement. Uh, but it was a great discussion, and I think you've illuminated a lot of these issues for our viewers. So thanks very much to both of you. Thank you for doing Thank this. Thank you. Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.